Hey folks, Jason here with Dirt Race Life. This video's got a little bit different format. I'm gonna put chapter markers on the timeline for this. Pop them right here, hope they show up. Uh, so go through that and if you wanna jump around because there's several different things that I wanna cover that's like everything from the car itself all the way to the new rules for Crate Racing USA Street Stocks is out for 2022. So with that, let's get busy. I had to have rotor cuff surgery, so I waited until the end of the race season, and then I went and had the surgery done. So it has slowed us down on our videos. It slowed us down on our build, making up some ground now. My son's been helping me, and where we can make sure that I'm going to be ready to race by March of next year, and we'll make sure we've got our new car ready as well. We did receive our floater in, got it in here. My son helped me. We got it mounted up and everything. For this, the big thing that I wanted to show, because I've been doing some work and, and I don't, our intention on this build is to not hide anything from you. You understand all the things we have to do. So the reason for using the jig and putting the frame square on it is to make sure that we've got perfect alignment on our car on the jig. So we measured our rear end location to this frame and this rear end was off a half inch. Now I checked. The mounts are perfect. Uh, everything is exactly where it should be as far as mounts go. But the frame itself on this car and how that it mounted up, it was a half inch to the right. Don't assume things are in the right place. Uh, because like if we left that, if we missed that, and this was all sitting over a half inch, we would be trying to string the car on the ground with wheels on it and stuff, and we would be off and trying to fix that and not even understanding the mounts aren't even in the right spot. How did we fix it? Well, we actually took and we moved the frame rails. And that's right, uh, pretty major ordeal, but it's important to make sure that our frame is perfectly square to start with. And so let me show you that. So what I found was my lower mounts Everything was perfect. And when I mounted the car up, I mounted based on these lower mounts and everything was perfect. And my upper mounts was over in this direction, um, you know, creating that half inch of movement over. And so the way that I fixed this, I took, I mounted everything up and then I turned around and put ratchet straps on the frame and I pulled this frame. Okay, so I pulled it at the back. Now I'm on a fixture, I'm, I'm welded onto my, onto my fixture uh, up right up here at the front. I turn around and I took cutoff wheel, 40,000 stick cutoff wheel, and I made a slice in the frame. As a matter of fact, I made two slices because I didn't want to get a real big gap that I couldn't fill in or I had to use a filler. I wanted to just make a slice, open it up slightly, and then turn around and fill it in. So I made two slices right here on this side. Same deal on the other side. So same on this side right here. So I pulled this frame over I hooked a ratchet strap onto this side of my jig and I pulled in that direction. I took a 40 thousandths cutoff wheel and I made a slice right down through here. And I just slid, 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 sliced halfway across the frame, down through here and down the, out the bottom, pulled it over, saw that I needed some more. So I sliced it, I ran the saw back through it again to open it up. I needed a little bit of an open cavity there for me to weld that and fill that in where that I'd get some good strength in it. And then I turned around and after I had everything sitting where it needed to be, I took a rosebud torch and I heated across these backside, the bottom and the top here, and just heated those and let those cool slow because I'm not wanting to create a stress. I'm wanting it to relieve, just relax and come over. So I cut, came back, cut again because I had closed it up. So I opened that up. I wanted to have that gap in there to be able to weld and fill that in so that I get a good strong weld. Um, but cut twice over here. On the other side, I made two separate cuts down through there because I didn't want to open up either one too much to be able to fill it in. Um, the other thing here is, is that, you know, the question of, is this legal? In my opinion, this is a legal and correct thing to do because this car likely had, you know, maybe had been in a wreck um, on the rear clip and had gotten twisted over, it's not correct to what it's drawn on the blueprints from GM. You know, it was over a half inch. And I missed it because like I squared up 
you know, on my lower points. And my lower points to the jig were in exactly the right place. So I know that bend is up in this top right here. And this is correcting that in a way. And the reason I'm cutting and not just pulling it is because I'm, you know, I'm making sure that I'm relieving that tension. Um, I don't have a big frame machine where I can overbend stuff and everything. So, you know, yeah, that's, that's what I'm doing. And any builder worth their salt that's building these chassis on a jig, they're doing this stuff. Now, whether they rip the frame like that and stitch it back together, or they're using porter powers and stuff and they're just bending the frame, um, or they're cutting their center loose, you know, or same deal, maybe it's on the front where the problem is or whatever, but they're fixing it. They aren't necessarily talking about it, they aren't necessarily demonstrating that and everything because that's a strategic advantage. But I promise you, anybody building worth their salt, they're going to make sure that they're starting out with a square, true frame, square, true mounting locations for all of their suspension. So this is important stuff, whether people discuss it or not. And I understand people saying, you know, no, I don't do that or I've never done that. Um, I get it because, like, if I left these welds and I didn't clean these off and paint that, because you're never going to know that was ever done, but if I left it and a technician's looking at my car, now the question becomes, well, did you cut this frame off and shorten this chassis up or do something like that? It's kind of a saying my grandfather taught me, don't go borrowing trouble. And it's good here. So, no, I'm not going to leave you know, a bunch of, you know, rip cut and weld marks and everything. I'm going to clean all that off because I don't want to, I don't want to have technicians that are looking at it and they're, you know, questioning like, well, what happened there? What were they doing? Um, so you're, you're not going to see this evidence anywhere. And so if you're not building cars and everything, and you may have an issue like this, you know, and you don't know to do this. Well, I'm telling you, do whatever you got to do get that joker where you need it to be. Otherwise, that's gonna be another issue in your setup that's creating an unknown factor. You wanna set yourself up for success from the start. Check yours, make sure your frame is square, do whatever you gotta do, get that frame square. Now, the next thing I wanted to show here, and let me see. All right, so this is a 7377 uh, GM frame. And on this frame, the shock mount is in front of the rear end. Talk about Crate Racing USA rule changes here toward the end of this video, but, uh, but that won't work. And then also we're running weight jacks and cups on the back of this. And so this mount that is right here, it had to go. And that's okay, that's allowable in the rules and everything. So I took these mounts off. And then what I did is, is I trimmed this off flat all the way across here. The reason I trimmed it off flat is because I'm gonna put a piece of inch and a half tubing across here. So that's gonna really beef up my mounts right here because this will absolutely move. Um, if you just leave this stock and you don't have this reinforced, then these upper control arms, um, torque is gonna, is gonna pull. And so this is gonna flex back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It's no good. Um, it probably does add to your forward bite until something breaks and something will break if you flex it long enough. So we're gonna put a piece of tubing across here and the final pinion angle, right now we're sitting at about 85 degrees, which is five degrees of pinion angle. We'll talk about pinion angle next. But uh, when we're gonna weld this up, and I don't want 85, but that's where I'm gonna weld it in at, and here's the reason why. Um, these bolt holes right here on my upper control arm mounts, I'm allowed a half inch of uh, variance on the length from stock for my, con uh, for my upper and lower control arms. And so it's not an issue for me to take, and like on the backs of these lower control arms, I'm gonna over drill these holes and put washers on them. I'll over drill the holes and put washers on them. And I'll set this rear end at static ride height, you know, at 86 degrees. I want four degrees of pinion angle. So I'm gonna go ahead and weld this up where this is not moving, it's done and secure. And then um, after we get everything done and we get it sitting down at exactly the right spot and stuff, I'll set the angle for four degrees of pinion angle and then I'll weld all those washers up 
Um, cause like I said, cause you know, like that one degree, you know, that'll be an eighth inch, you know, or a quarter inch on the length of this control arm as far as hole to hole. And I'm allowed a half inch and that's so that you can correct like your pinion angle and stuff. So not an issue there at all. All right, so that's what's going on here. If you're seeing this cut out, you see this cut back, what's going on, that's what it is. And like I said, our final target here is four degrees of pinion angle. Why four degrees? I'm going with four degrees because I'm running stop soft rubber bushings on all eight mount, all eight mount locations. Um, and that's gonna give me that maximum amount of travel, twist, and bite. Um, so when I torque up, when I'm on the throttle, all of that rubber, that's just like the rubber biscuits on a torque arm. That's giving me that, that movement of that rear end um, to help it to be able to absorb that torque and hook it up to the ground on a dry slick track. For that reason, I'm gonna get a little bit more movement if I had hind joints, um, if I had solid spherical bearings in some of these, maybe instead of four degrees, it needs to be three degrees, you know? Maybe if everything was a hind joint, um, you know, maybe it needs to be two degrees at that point. Um, but for me, with all rubber bushings and everything, my target is four degrees. Let's talk about pinion angle. All right, so here we go on pinion angle. Let's just suppose that we have an engine that is sitting like mine, um, with the top of the engine completely, you know, zero degrees. Um, the engine plate is exactly at 90 degrees, okay? And that's the reason I build my cars. <laughs> the reason I build my cars this way it makes it real easy uh, for me to do pinion angle. But we got a transmission that's coming out, all right? And so we know that when this yoke goes into this transmission, this yoke is, you know, zero degrees. Um, relative to that transmission. Now, the rear end of the car won't necessarily be perfectly in line with this engine right here. This rear end is gonna be, you know, where a pinion is, like especially on a nine inch Ford, it's gonna be a little bit lower. All right, and so we got this pinion that comes down. So I'm gonna draw this rear end right here, all right? And let's just say that this is at, like I said, mine, it's at 86 degrees, so it's turned down, it's turned down by four degrees, all right? This right here represents a pinion angle of four degrees. That four degrees is the difference between this angle here and this angle here, or you know, you could also say the angle, the easiest way to measure these is like on a nine inch Ford, you've got this flat face front on it where you bolt in your third member. So that angle right there, which is 86 degrees and like I'll take and I'll make sure my motor plate says exactly 90 degrees. And so that's four degrees of difference. That's very different from what some people um, believe. And they'll say, no, this right here is pinion angle. No, it's not. It's not. Um, it, it is the angle of your drive shaft coming into your third member right there, just like that is the angle of the drive shaft coming into your yoke. But they don't represent your pinion angle difference that you are after in your car. That is just the drive shaft itself where it's at. That is constantly changing according to the ride height of your car and according to uh, on the track, whether you're, you know, in the turn, on the throttle, off the throttle, you know, that rear end's moving up and down, um, what's going on there. So that's constantly changing. But this pinion angle right here isn't. Why is this pinion angle, uh, this is what pinion angle is versus that. And I'll tell you, here's why. Um, you're after a specific issue when you have that drive shaft and you've got your U-joint on your drive shaft, those two U-joints right there that pass power through, you know, and you got your course, I don't know how to draw that. But when it's passing power through, when this drive shaft is in line right here, it wouldn't matter where the U-joints are, if they were in line to each other, anything. It's just gonna pass straight through. As you turn on this end, you're gonna get the same turn on that end. All right, as you start making that change in angle, 
And so if this has got angle in it right here, it becomes very critical because here's why. If you have got two angles going on and those two angles are parallel to each other. So like this shaft here and this shaft here, you know, are going through this drive shaft right here. Okay. Or if we, you know, like we drew it here, you know, this shaft right here and then where it comes into my third member right here. If those two, if that horizon for that and that horizon for that, if those two are equal to each other, then as this turns on the front and this turns on the back, it's going to be one to one all the way through the rotation. Now, the dry shaft itself, it's difficult to see this, but if you, you get some in the shop and you get, put some real strong angles on them, you can actually see this tinkering around with them. But this drive shaft itself, as this turns through one rotation, this drive shaft will actually speed up and slow down. Okay? And that has to do with it orbiting around, you know, that U-joint, you know, with two poles on it. That's, that's what's going on there. All right? So as it rotates around on that U-joint, that drive shaft itself, as that angle becomes stronger, the drive shaft is speeding up and slowing down. Now, if these two angles are the same to each other, if they were truly, you know, zero to each other with where this is to where this is, you will never know that because where it comes out, it's going to be the exact same rotation, rotation um, amount as it's turning as the front. So it's not going to speed. So like the front's not speeding up and slowing down. You know, your engine, your crankshaft, and everything's carrying through smoothly. And so it's a smooth, let's say you're turning 6,000 RPMs. It's a smooth 6,000. Okay, the drive shaft itself has got this minor speed up and slow down going on. It's still turning 6,000, but through the cycle of each rotation, that's happening. If you're at zero back here on the back, though, that's converted back out to be smooth again. As you introduce pinion angle, so if like this drive shaft was, you know, zero to this end, but had an angle on that end, what happens is, is you're coming in, you know, with that smooth RPM, and then this drive shaft is speeding up and slowing down, and that's passing that through. So if, you know, if I have an angle difference between the two, then that angle difference is going to cause me um, to have this oscillation going on, and I may or may not feel it. A few degrees, you're never going to feel that. You know, seven or eight degrees, you're going to feel that. You know, that's going to be a vibration in your rear end that you're going to feel. Um, and I know that from experience. But, uh, but yeah, that's what's going on. And so that, that oscillation that's happening, that speed up, slow down that you're passing through, that is absorbing the torque and horsepower off that engine. That's converting that into that movement and heat and friction. And, you know, and it's putting wear, it, it's put wear on your U-joints, on the needle bearings on them. It's putting wear on your third member. Um, not necessarily something that it can't take. Um, it can take it year after year, uh, but it is. It's, it's, converting that, it's converting that power that you would be putting to the tires into that energy that is that movement and that oscillation instead. And that's the reason that some people have seen where that they have added more pinion angle, like an excessive amount of pinion angle, and it would actually help a car on a dry slick track. Because what they were doing is, is they were binding things up and taking power away from the wheels, and that was helping them to be able to get bit into the track. They were taking power away. Now, I don't agree with that. I think what we should do is we should lift our foot and we should learn how to control the throttle instead. You want to have all your throttle available to you for when you can apply it all. All right? So, the four degrees. Like, I'm going for four degrees here. And I've drawn a bunch of extra lines. And this is turning into a hot mess. I'm sorry, y'all. But why, why four degrees? Well, I'm wanting four degrees... You know, like I said, because, you know, those rubber bushings that I've got connected, what I'm wanting is I'm wanting this thing to twist up to zero or close to it. Uh, this is, you know, we're talking about a four-link suspension right here, you know, with, with uh, the bars on it. 
you know, I'm going to have all rubbers, so I'm going to go with four degrees. So hopefully these two become parallel to each other under full throttle. That's what I'm after. Um, and if I'm really good at how this works out, I can do that on a real dry slick track. But that's what's going on with pinion angles. So it's not, so like I said, it's not this measurement right here of this angle between the drive shaft and the rear in itself. Don't get me wrong. If you have got an excessive angle, you know, in your drive shaft, like, you know, a big four wheel drive with a big lift on it and everything, you can, that angle can get so excessive that you'll put, you're just working your U joint to death. You know, you've got so much movement going out on your needle bearings, on your U joint cups, that you just wear your U joints out. Pinion angle, difference between the rear end itself and the engine and transmission. Um, real easy to measure. You know, like I said, go to the back of your engine block, throw an angle finder on it, see what it is, and then throw an angle finder on the front of your rear end. And that difference between the two, that's your pinion angle. Let's talk about leaf springs for a second. Um, I've had several people ask me about leaf springs and pinion angle. Yes, you run more pinion angle with leaf springs and there is a reason for that. Um, so here we are again, we got a transmission coming out. We've got a rear end right here and we have got a set of leafs and that's really ugly drawing, I know, I know. All right, so we're hooked on, we got a leaf going across right here and that leaf has got an arch in it, all right? And you'll see people, they'll say, you know, seven degrees of pinion angle on stacked steel leaves, I agree with that. I agree, I agree with seven degrees. And just from my own uh, observations, here's what's going on. You know, when you torque up right here, you don't, like for example, on a four link car, you know, if you've got rubber bushings um, or poly bushings and stuff, they're only gonna give so much and they're gonna quit. They're not gonna give any more. And then as you work through, you know, your ride height up and down, that's not going to make those rubber bushings give more um, on like a metric car or on like a, a 73, 77 frame like I'm building over here. But on a leaf car, this leaf right here, it can flex out. And so what happens is, is that when you step on the throttle, this will flex out and it will become sh like straight. And they don't necessarily ever get truly straight, but it's like it's getting straight. But then also, you have to keep in mind that as this works up and down, this front of this leaf is acting like a truck arm, or it's like a bar that's connected to the bottom of your rear end. So as your rear end goes up and down, your rear end is on a radius uh, rod with that front of that leaf spring. So you're on a, you know, basically you're on a big circle right here. And so that angle of that rear end is changing as it goes up and down in ride height. And that's very different from a four link car. Um, and so for that reason, you will get more movement on the rear end of a leaf car than you will of a metric car. And so for me, seven degrees has been a good number that keeps me because I'm after zero. That's what I'm after is zero, but I don't want to go past it. And so it's been seven degrees. However, I learned the hard way um, that on composite springs, that's too much. And a uh, composite, so I run the Hyperco composite springs, really like them, have had great success with them because they're very consistent. I'm an advocate. If you are allowed to run the composite springs in your class, I do think that they're an advantage. They don't have quite as much forward bite, in my opinion, as a fresh set of stacked steel leaves, but the bite they have is consistent week after week, season after season. They continue to perform exactly the same. That gives you the ability to tune your car and make it better overall, more predictable, more drivable. You show up at the track, you know what it's going to do, lap one. Um, so a composite spring 
has got less arch than a stacked steel spring. And so if I did, so if this is a composite, and then this is a stacked steel here with, you know, multiple layers, um, the composites, like, for example, the Hyperco, you know, it's about four and a half inches, and that's that difference, you know, from the bottom to the center of the eyes, whereas, like, this Landrum, I think this is, like, say, at best I remember, like, a Landrum 200, that's more like six and a half inches, all right? And part of the reason for that um, that I've seen here, this, this composite, um, when you, when it works, the rate's correct on it, but it moves, it seems to move more overall, like the whole thing moves up and down. It doesn't, you don't get as much of the drastic uh, deflection on the front of it under throttle. It's like it's stiffer and that's where it gets into, you know, maybe they don't have quite as much drive. Um, so you don't get as much movement on the front of them, and then as they spring, the whole thing seems to move more up and down. Whereas on a stacked steel leaf, you get more deflection under throttle on the front, and those stacks move against each other, and then the spring is moving, you know, more toward the rear um, on a stacked steel. And so for that reason, what I found was is that the seven degrees, I was, you know, when I put a camera on it, I was not getting anywhere near zero. And so I dropped back and I was at four and I think right now, on, right now my Camaro, I think I've got it on about five degrees is what I'm on. I think I've run four before without a problem, but I believe I'm on five. I think I found some more bite and I'm up to five. Whereas on the stacked leaf, I'll be more like seven. And with that, oh, let's talk about wheel offsets. So let's talk wheel offsets for a second. So like on my chassis that I'm building right now, that's a 7377 and it's got roughly a 62 inch um, wheel track width, the hub to hub, all right? So here's my two hubs and it's 62 inches hub to hub. It's a little over that, but roughly 62. Same as a Camaro, I think it's 62 and a quarter, something like that. But I've got 62, that rear end I put under that car I put a 60 inch rear end under the back of it. I did that on purpose um, because I want my rear track width to run inside of my front. And the reason for it is because I want to run all the same wheel offsets, makes life a lot easier. Um, you know, find out what your roll is, rollout is on your tires. The only thing I have to worry about is bead locks versus non bead locks. So, like for me, on this new build, you know, I've got like five non-bead locks and three bead locks, um, but they're all 15-8 four-inch offsets. And so I will put those 15-8 four-inch offsets all the way around this car. And so if I don't run any spacers, my rear end is inside of my front end. That car with one inch inside like that, that car will be a little bit more predictable and drivable for me and it, um, it will turn better. It will be easier for me to keep it rolled over with that right rear inside of that right front by an inch. It'll make the car a little bit more drivable. Now, why four inch offset? Well, because it is a 62 inch track width, I'm wanting to get that tire, you know, up onto that frame some because the relationship between the track width and the center of gravity. So if I drew a side view of the car here, and then like you've got a center of gravity line for that car. As the track width gets wider, then that becomes um, more stable. And then as the track width is narrower, you know, it, it'll, it'll turn over easier, you know, just like a, you know, a base of a glass that's wide at the bottom versus narrow um, and how it'll turn over. And so for this car, with it having a 62 inch width on the front, I opted for a four inch offset wheel on this. 
And then I use the um, one inch wheel spacers. I like wheel spacers. I run long studs where I can put a wheel spacer on anywhere I want. But if I'm on a track that's hooked up, um, got a lot of bite in it, um, a lot of drive on the track, then what I can do is, is I can take and I can add a one inch spacer onto that rear and now I'm running heads up. And so a real common setup for me and what I suspect that I'll probably start out on this car is, is I'll probably have a one inch spacer on my left side all time and I'll run my left side heads up and then on the right side right here, I'll, if the track has got a lot of drive in it, the track's hooked up pretty good, I'll probably have my spacer in and then when the track starts slicking off um, and drying out and everything, I'll pull that spacer out, I'll get a minimum change in my scale numbers, uh, a minimal change in how the car drives, but it's just going to help me to get the car to stay over in the turn on a drier, slicker track. And so that's going to turn around and just help me to be able to get off that turn faster. Help keep me turned over in the turn, rolling through it, driving off. Um, and so four inch offset with a 62 inch um, track width. But on a metric, you probably wouldn't want to run a four inch offset. And the reason being is because like on a metric car, those hub widths is 58 something. Uh, and so, you know, you'll see a lot of the guys on the metrics, they'll be running, you know, 58 inch, you know, rears on it. And then they'll, what they'll do is, is they'll put a 58 inch um, floater under the back of it. And then they'll put the Nova lowers um, on the front of it. And it actually gives it a little bit more. And so they're accomplishing the same thing. They put a little bit longer lower control arm on the front of it. And they get that out to, you know, more like 60 out further. Um, I don't think it'll give you that much. But anyway, you get a little bit more because it's a little bit longer lower control arm. And so you're accomplishing that same thing of putting, you know, that you can put that right rear in um, in alignment to that right front. So you can tuck it in um, and get that same drive on a dry slick track. But the entire car has a narrower track width. So if you had the same car with that same center of gravity, if you ran a four inch offset on this car, you'd get a lot more rollover. They drive very different from each other. Um, and you know, this car, you know, it might be too much. And so like on this car right here, you might say, well, instead of 15, eight fours, four inch offset, maybe I just want to run 15, eight, um, three inch offset or two inch offset. You know, maybe, you know, you want to run a two inch offset on the front, you know, and a three inch on the back. And like I said, I like to set mine up where that I just use the same offset wheels all the way around it and use spacers. Uh, but you know, you work with what you've got. And so, but yeah, on this car right here, it's gonna be a lot more common for you to be on a two inch or a three inch. Whereas if you've got a wider track width, maybe a four inch is more appropriate. And so that's what's going on with wheel offsets. What really matters is how wide the car is and how high the center of gravity is. Now from this, the only other note I could give on this would be that if you've got a car and you were struggling to get the center of gravity up enough, so if you're really struggling to get the car to get over and stay over and you feel like that you've done everything else you need to do, then an option can be to tuck those wheels under the car and specifically you know, if you tuck those right side wheels up under the car, both front and back by another inch or two inches, if you can, if you've got the clearance, well, what you're doing is, is you're narrowing that base, that ratio with the center of gravity height to width. So you're narrowing that up. So that's making the car less stable. Um, you know, and then also your center of gravity, you're moving it to the right. Um, so that can be a solution if you're trying to free a car up is just to move those right side tires, you know, in, you know, if you're trying to tighten a car up exactly the opposite, you know, and so just keep that in mind. Cray Racing USA just released the 2022 street stock rule package and they made a couple of changes. Some of them are significant um, and some, some are minor, but uh, just going through, I just went through, they make it really easy. You can go to their website. Uh, I'll put a link on the description for this video and look for yourself. They make the changes in red. So it makes it really easy to see what's changed. On the, uh, on the engine seals that are no longer allowed, they added fast track to that list. 
um, for that. Not sure what's going on there, but they're on that list for not allowed. The engine claim has been increased to $4,200, and it says, or the current cost from Newsom Raceway Parts. So whatever Newsom Raceway Parts is getting, whatever the greater um, amount is, that's what the engine claim amount is going to be for 2022. On the MSD boxes, they're only allowing the 6AL and the 6ALN box on the MSD boxes. Now, I run the 6AL, and I really like that. But uh, not what sure what's going on there. I guess as far as the MSD boxes having a lot of programmable features and stuff. Um, but, you know, cheaters going to cheat when it comes to that stuff regardless of what they specify. No bump stops or bump springs. One spring rubber per corner allowed. So, I know, now, the really big change. No bump stops at all in Crate Racing USA Street Stocks. No bump springs. And they put that in the rule book three different times, adding it. So they're being very clear that they're out. And I think it's going to be a lot of mixed feelings on that. I kind of can see both sides of it. It makes, if you understand the bump and you've got a car that you've gotten it conquered and working good, it can make for a really great driving, consistent car, especially on a smooth, dry, slick track. But that also is probably helping to keep only certain racers in the winning circle. And because, you know, once you've conquered it, if you've got access to builders that understand it and you've got access to pull down machines to make sure that you're getting right on your number pulled over on the right front with that bump set up to what you're looking for, you know, not everybody has access to that stuff. So by eliminating the bump stops and the bump springs, they probably are opening the field up to more people to maybe get cars that, you know, can build and be as competitive. Uh, the only thing I say to that is, is that, you know, yeah, some of the guys that was set up on bumps that were running really soft right front springs and then making up for it with a bump, they're going to be scrambling for a while at the beginning of the season. But now, talent's talent, and people that really understand setup. Yeah, they may chase and move around on springs for a little bit, but now they'll they'll get them cars just back just as fast as they were when they were on the bump. Um, but uh, but it could mix it up. It could make for a lot different cars. You know, maybe it spreads out your points a little bit more um, and just keeps one or two from dominating. So overall, I think it'll be a little bit of hard feelings, but uh, yeah, I agree. It's probably a good move. Let's see. Rear shock lower mounts uh, are required to be behind the rear end. Uh, not sure on that. I have see I see a lot of cars that are really fast that have got their shocks behind the rear end. On a metric car, they're behind the rear end stock. And so, you know, I see everybody setting their cars up and they're mounting them back there. And, of course, it's on all fabricated mounts. But it's some, front, some left, left side um, mounts on the front. Um, I understand it. I get what people are after. They're getting, you know, just massive amounts of movement and everything. And you can, you can move further with the left, you know, shock on the front and what they're doing there. But, um, but I'm fine with it. That, like this frame I have, is it had the shocks in the front factory and quick performance. I didn't specify for them uh, where to put the shock mounts, and they put front factory location shock mounts on my car so they'll have to come back off either i'll just leave them and not use them or i'll cut them off and move them to the rear um but uh but yeah so i don't think that's going to upset a lot of people few people may have to cut off and move maybe one mount but that's not the end of the world and it's in plenty of time to be ready for racing and let's see oh and another one that i think is pretty big and i'm going to take advantage of any brake caliper it's got to be in a fixed position, so you can't have a floating brake on it. But it's now it's any brake caliper, and it used to be that you had to have a factory steel caliper. So like you run, a, you know, you had to run like a metric or a, a big GM caliper on your car, and now it's just any caliper. Well, okay, then I'm going to be running Willwood calipers, aluminum. I mean, and, and I'm going to be running. I, it it opens up my choices for brake pads and brake pad compounds. And it opens up, you know, as far as the calipers, I'll, I will end up, I'm going to make a prediction on this. I'm going to spend less on my brakes by using racing calipers and racing pads than I would have. Because I can get used uh, racing calipers easily. 
There's late mile racing calipers everywhere. I will have no problem getting some calipers to go on my floater. And I have not bought my brackets yet or anything. So that's, thank you Crate Racing for getting these rules out uh, because it's hitting just right for me. Uh, because yeah, I'll go to a dual piston setup um, or four piston setup, you know, and put some real racing calipers on the back of my car. So I'll take advantage of that. And the brake pads themselves, I'll be able to get brake pads cheaper. So. I am fine with that, and it doesn't knock anybody out with the current brakes, um, so you don't have to necessarily, you know, upgrade. There's not a big performance change there, especially, it's all about having the right pads and then the right pressure, um, you know, not necessarily, you know, like saving a pound of weight on the caliper. It all adds up, but it's not going to be the difference between whether you win or lose. So that is the changes, and poor little old bump is done. So I don't know if you've noticed, but um, I've got my shirts done. We've got our first run. We've got long sleeve and short sleeve. Got the big emblem on the back. Um, the sleeve shot down through here. Really nice shirts. Like them. Real happy with how that's going. Uh, for reference, this is a 2XL on me, and I weigh 300 pounds. Um, yeah, I'm a big old boy. But uh, anyway... The website is dirtracelife.com. So we've got our shirts on there. You can buy them directly. They ship out UPS. And then also check out my website too because I've been adding information. So there's a lot of stuff that I've accumulated uh, like you know information on different center links and setup information and stuff. And I'm starting to get that all pasted in. So check out what I got going on there. Let me know what you're looking for there. I'm gonna start trying to build just more and more information there so they can go along with. So there's somewhere where I'm talking about something to reference information to. So I'm really hopeful that that's gonna be a big help. Shout out to Jason Brown. He just joined as a member sponsoring Dirt Race Life. Makes a huge difference on me getting all this stuff up and going and getting more information out there to support our sport. So thank you, Jason. I appreciate that. Appreciate all my members that are sponsoring um, this channel and what's going on here. So if you wanna look into that more, I'll have a link at the end of the video and then also in the description. And of course, if any of these sections are information, I know this is kinda of like a mixture of stuff but if one of the things you found useful hey leave me a comment hit that thumbs up button it makes a difference on us getting this out to more people and of course subscribe folks thank y'all